borderline personality disorder, the ultra part two. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. It's the ultra talking about another ultra, not an ultra BPD, but an ultra marathon runner. But I'm explaining that how often these individuals are misdiagnosed as people who are either suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder or they're actually narcissists. Let's learn more from the New York Times article. On a Monday morning in May, De La Rosa, 33, and his wife, Jade Bellsberg, 31, sat at their favorite cafe in San Luis Obispo, California, where they live. Bellsberg is a formidable ultramarathon runner herself, and they'd spent the weekend running in the mountains. The mile showed in their suntan faces, weary eyes, and the slowness in their steps. Over tea and coffee, the couple talked about Della Rosa's mental illness, their athletic accomplishments and their future, which they see as closely connected. Della Rosa is tall and broad-shouldered with unkept hair and freckles that bring a boyishness to his face. He said his mental illness was both a strength and a crutch. It was a superpower in races like Barclay that required gritting it out and going into the storm, where any idiot would stop because the conditions were tolerable. Notice the dismissiveness there. De La Rosa said, but this special idiot, because he has BPD, would need validation. Because this win means so much to me, I will push harder than anyone else. But he doesn't actually understand why it means so much more to him. Like many people who have borderline personality disorder, De La Rosa finds it hard to regulate his emotions. He explained the intensity of his feelings on a scale of 1 going up to 10. When he tips over a 7, he said, his fight or flight response is triggered, and he spirals into suicidal ideations, rage or intense self-loathing. Suicidal ideation is something that a narcissist will engage in. Rage is fury. And the intense self-loathing is being described as part of creation of a complex individual, but also part of the pity play. Fears of abandonment, threat to control, and of rejection, threat to control, are two of his strongest triggers. Note that he recognises, albeit in the context of BPD, that he doesn't like the concept of being abandoned or being rejected. Now, most people don't take kindly to being abandoned or rejected, but they don't have the response that a narcissist has, namely the ignition of fury and a consequential implementation of some form of manipulation in order to ensure that the narcissist is able to then nullify the threat to control and assert that control. It is interesting to note that he describes two things which are very much threats to control. As De La Rosa's career has stalled, Bellsberg, who had not run in a race longer than 10 kilometres when the couple met a decade ago, has taken off. When she passed him on a recent run, he responded by hitting himself in the head. Her overtaking him is a threat to control. He responds by hitting himself by virtue of the ignition of fury and not being able to place it, but also trying to provoke a response by her. He said all of this in a matter-of-fact way that would be easy to overlook if he were not talking about self-harm. Dr. Peter Attia, physician and author of Outlive, The Science and Art of Longevity, said he suspects that dopamine endorphins and a need for distractions, an urge to self-punish and a longing for self-esteem are among the reasons some people with mental illness, addiction and trauma are attracted to endurance sports. I would suggest also that another reason why people are attracted to them is the capacity that it provides to them to assert control over other individuals as a consequence of their achievements the receipt of fuel as a consequence of people's reaction to those achievements, the ability to acquire character traits through their involvement in such running, and, of course, the residual benefits, which could be anything from facade management through to money. De La Rosa, who moved to San Diego with his mother after his parents' divorce, 
which could potentially have created a lack of control environment this individual many years ago, said he could trace his unhealthy relationship was running to his teenage years, agreed, I wasn't that good at cross-country in high school and was not going to stand out. And then I did a marathon, and everyone was like, holy crap, you did a marathon, he said. As someone who felt worthless and struggled to find his identity, he found all his self-worth in ultra-running. Or rather, this allowed people to demonstrate that they were under control by praising him and providing with fuel. In late 2017, De La Rosa was diagnosed with a heart condition that could have been fatal if unaddressed. He had successful open-heart surgery, but later developed pericarditis, a condition that inflames the tissue around the heart. Unable to train or race at the level he was accustomed to, and with his running career in limbo, De La Rosa spiralled out of control. All of them are being threats to control. During a run in British Columbia a few months after his surgery, Bellsberg was concerned about the worsening weather and wanted to turn back. De La Rosa said he got extremely angry, shoved his wife in the snow and threatened to push her off the mountain. Her suggestion of turning back is a threat to control. He shows the ignition of fury, engages in physical violence and issues a threat, demonstrating a sense of entitlement, objectification of his wife and an absence of emotional empathy. Immediately overcome with shame and horror, he looked for a cliff to jump off, or rather as a nullification of further threat to control because she didn't respond in the way that she required, he doled out a pity play. On the way down the mountain, Bellsberg said her husband alternated between crying, screaming and laughing manically. All of these behaviours, of course, being prompted in order to do what? Necessitate a response from her. And in so doing, by generating that response, cause her to provide fuel and demonstrate that she's under control. In 2019, De La Rosa shocked the ultra-running community when he posted on Instagram that he was on a high-risk suicide watch. If he is, <clears throat> that is a highly private matter, not to be shared. But he, with a lack of boundary recognition and the sense of entitlement, believes that it's appropriate for him to tell the world all about the fact that he's on a high-risk suicide watch. Why? Pity play. He shared his diagnosis, unnecessary to do so, but again shares that lack of boundary recognition and mostly stepped back from intense training and competition. Bellsberg, who is now a sponsored runner and who represented Canada in the World Mountain and Trail Running Championships in June, is thin, with long dark wavy hair and eyes the colour of Arctic ice. When she smiles, her entire face scrunches. She said there were signs long before De La Rosa's heart surgery that he was dealing with mental illness. When he could not run because of a knee injury, he tried to drown himself. The knee injury is a threat to control. He responds to nullify that threat to control by drowning himself as a means of withdrawal from that threat. Bellsberg, who started seeing a therapist after her husband's diagnosis, said she often plays the role of caregiver. This invariably is the role that is adopted by the intimate partner primary source of a narcissist. It's me suggesting the residential programme, and then it's me suggesting medication, she said. No, how he isn't doing that. Lack of accountability. It's been such a fight each time, and it's very isolating because very few people have a behind-the-scenes look at what is going on. Bellsberg's perseverance and De La Rosa's sometimes reluctant focus on his own well-being have helped. He is on a mood stabiliser and for four years has been in dialectical behaviour therapy, which teaches people how to reframe their thoughts and behaviour and helps them deal with distress. De La Rosa is now on track to get a master's degree in sports psychology from the University of Western States, and he and Bellsberg have built an online coaching business, working with around 70 runners. While research shows that most people with borderline personality disorder see an improvement in their symptoms with treatment over time, De La Rosa does not find comfort in that. He is frustrated by what he feels is a slow recovery, lack of patience, threat to control, and points out that a lot of the people with the condition do not survive. For me, recovery has been like sitting in front of a TV screen on full blast a foot away, De La Rosa said. Years later, I've learned to put that TV upstairs in a different room in my head and turn the volume down a bit. I don't think I'll ever stop it from playing, but it's not as loud as it used to be. By the time the Barclay Marathons came around this spring, De La Rosa felt ready to compete. When he decided his race was over a loop and a half into the five 20-plus mile loops it takes to complete the event, he was at peace with the decision and said he'd learned an invaluable lesson. 
At Barclay, I was prepared for everything but my why, said Della Rosa, who was coached by Bellsberg. 20% of me was like, I want to finish this race because I still want to be relevant so that people will still care about me and so I am not forgotten. But at 3am, when it is pissing cold and my headlamp is going dim and the scenery is ugly and the food is terrible, what came to me is that I am worthy no matter what. My self-worth is not something I have to fight, fight, fight for. Suffering has always been a part of extreme sports. The sports and wellness journalist Alex Hutchinson said nobody enters an ultramarathon without expecting to test one's physical limits. But Hutchinson, author of Endure, Mind, Body and the Curiously Elastic Limits of Human Performance, believes there is a shift away from the view that the point of running ultramarathons is to suffer. While the approach that, I am going to be an absolute glutton for punishment, might get you through one ultramarathon, it is not likely to get you through ten, he said. When De La Rosa started running ultramarathons in the mid-2000s, his heroes were ultra runners who glorified mental and physical suffering, seeing it as a sign of strength and commitment. De La Rosa believes he would have benefited if he'd found a coach or mentor who showed him that he could be successful and still be kind to himself from the beginning. As a coach, De La Rosa champions the work of Steve Magnus, whose book, Do Hard Things, focuses on how athletes can use positive self-talk when experiencing discomfort. De La Rosa now shows his clients that they need self-love to build resilience and mental toughness. He is trying to put those lessons in practice in his own training and life. After struggling with depression and extreme exhaustion following Barclay, and with encouragement from Bellsberg, De La Rosa has accepted that he cannot participate in multi-day events and more extreme 100-mile races. For now, De La Rosa, who is a sponsored runner, will continue to work on his mental health and focus on single-day events. Bellsberg and De La Rosa, who have 21 rescue animals, including cats, dogs, rabbits, guinea peas, a rat, a 35-year-old pony and a pet crow, said that the moments of joy they have experienced running together far outweigh the tough days. One of their funniest memories is when De La Rosa paced Bellsberg in one of her first 100-mile races, and the couple hallucinated that they were seeing an aid station serving pancakes. I've always admired Nick's determination, said Bellsberg, who is also a ballroom dancer and a writer. I see it in aspects of his life, such as his tackling BPD. He has such a strong willingness to try anything if it will help, and I think that's a really commendable trait, and it's there in his running too. He has a remarkable capacity to blow up during races, ignition of fury, but still perseveres, and he even finishes very, very strong. An interesting article that demonstrates many behaviours which would support that this individual may well be a narcissist, and once again, that the diagnosis of BPD isn't appropriate. And the fact is, I'd imagine that Bellsberg would have a lot more to say about his behaviour. I should imagine that behind the scenes, he's shown, for example, and admitted to an instance of physical abuse and issuing threats. I should imagine that she could tell a lot more about him being emotionally abusive towards her, about explaining how he has become an individual where she is always catering to his needs and that she is that caregiver which demonstrates that it is a necessity for her to placate him and appease him for the purposes, of course, of giving him the control that he needs. What are your views in relation to this? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.